Okay. We're going to get this done no matter what. If you've encountered me before, you know it takes a lot to stop me. Um, although I must make one small correction for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to do this because the econ I'm an economist and I'm manic about numbers. Um, it is said that I've taught 10% of the alumni. Well, if we are taught, uh, first, <clears throat> it's not it is said I have taught because I count everything. I can tell you I've assigned 30,274 grades, so I know exactly how many people I've taught, and I know exactly how many engineers I've taught, and I have not, ten, I have not taught 10% of the engineering alumni. I've taught 20% of the engineering alumni because you were, because you are disproportionately represented in my classes, which is why it's a higher proportion uh, of, the of the engineering faculty than um, there's, some, there's a reason that your economics professor is delivering the engineering reunion lecture, uh, and that is, and that, well, that's, that's in fact the reason. Um, again, it is certainly my pleasure, uh, my pleasure indeed to be with you this afternoon. I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad to be here for lots of reasons. One, because I'm glad to, I want to welcome you back to the University of Waterloo. And some of you are, uh, there's a few young faces, so welcome to the University of Waterloo for the very first time. I uh, hope we see you. Uh, hope we see you again. And of course, I'm I'm really happy to be here for, of course, second reason because in fall uh, 20, uh, 22, 23, so the term coming up, and you will understand that the only years I understand are academic years. So as far as I'm concerned, is 22, 23 about to begin in a couple of months? Um, and in September of this year, I begin my 42nd year as a faculty member at the University of Waterloo. So, thank you. Yeah, well, you know, there's some advantage of you know being you know last man standing. So I'm I'm still standing, and that's a, and that's a good thing. Although it's getting a little disarming when I meet former students and they look surprised that I'm still alive. <laughs> but it's one thing to say, "Oh, haven't you retired yet?" And cl clearly, I haven't. But uh, to be surprised that you're still alive is a bit of a strange experience. I'm getting used to. Uh, we got we've got a lot of stuff to cover. Because as I'm sure you understand, I take my subject and my discipline very seriously, and I take, have always taken very seriously my obligation to do the best job I can to inform people, including professional engineers, about the state of the world in which they live and the state of their economy. And we live in somber times. Let's, let's be very clear they are somber times. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, you know, uh, minimize the challenges that we face. But so what I want to do this afternoon is I want to do a quick historic review, because some of you are expecting the weekly briefing. Well, I can't, from the last time you got the weekly briefing to today, to cover everything that's happened in the last, like, God knows how many decades. So you're not going to quite get a, well, you're going to get a sort of truncated, strange version of a briefing. And since I don't know whether you were with me in 1981 when I began teaching, or like five, ten years ago, uh, I'm going to do a quick historical review of everything that's happened since 81 uh, to now. Then I'm going to look at, a, at the state of the current economy relatively briefly. And then I want most of my remarks to be about the future, because I think that's the most useful thing I can do and talk about the, uh, what lies ahead. And of course, so just so you understand the room, and I do believe the air is coming back on, thank goodness. Plant ops, bless them and their machinery. The other thing I'd observe is just for the protocol of the afternoon, I want to make some introductory, I want to, I want to provide context. Some context, I'm a fan of context. If you've encountered me before, you know, I want you to the context of, this, of the world you're in, the an, and a proper analytic framework, and of course, the broad context of the knowledge of what has happened. We want to look forward. We can't look forward without looking backwards. I've told you that 50 times. I have not changed my mind in, in that regard either. Uh, so what I want to do is set that context, do the past, do the current, and then I want to invite questions, and then I want to roll up by looking into the future. I'm going to, before I, we, we do q and I'm going to do a bit of introduction to the future. Then I want you to ask questions, because that's the best way to customize these remarks to what you're interested in. And then I want to do a wrap-up. And then if, if there's still questions after, I can always stay a few minutes to answer them as well. So it's important that we, you know, we stay on time and uh, so that you can engage in the other social activities of reunion. Uh, so let's, let's begin. Uh, oh, so what has, what's been happening? Since I began in 81, I have now taught through four economically induced recessions, which you will remember are two consecutive quarters of economic contraction when the economy shrinks. I'm tempted to do a pop quiz, but I am, 
too afraid I would be you know, depressed with the results, so I'm not going to do that. So recession, two, two quarters of the year in which the economy shrinks. That has happened on four occasions driven by economic circumstances and once, of course, by the, by the brief contraction of economic, uh, economic activity caused by the pandemic. Uh, and now, and now, and now, oh my goodness, this is a good year to come to reunion and hear an economics lecture because we may be poised on the edge of recession number six since I began uh, teaching. However, uh, let me also tell you what I've told you in the past because I've taught through these recessions. But I have told you, and I am going to reiterate the point, that notwithstanding that we have had, excuse me, five contractions of economic activity, five contractions of economic activity are vastly outnumbered by the quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter of which the economy grew. So as a, as a practical matter, this quarter, so first quarter, excuse me, of this year, which is the most current economic data we have for the GDP, your out, the output of the Canadian economy is at or almost at its historic high. So in terms of the total output produced by the Canadian economy and all the men and women working and all the businesses that exist, we've never produced more. That's important to understand it since we are certainly facing some degree of economic adversity. It's important to celebrate the accomplishments of the past, not to make us complacent about today, but to make sure we don't panic. I have coped with too many of you too many times when I'm in the middle of a recession and the job opportunities are, are limited as you approach graduation for you to decide that the world has come to an end, that Canada is a basket case, that there is no hope for you and you have to emigrate. You're not even sure where to emigrate because, of course, one, then you notice there are recessions going on. Canada never has a recession with the rest of the world booming. Never has uh, and never ha we never have and we haven't thus far. So recognize that those circumstances means that we've grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. You also, one of the most important things to notice uh, with respect to the health of any economy <clears throat> is, of course, the number of people working. And when I entered this classroom, I told you in 1981, I told you in 1991, I told you in 2001, uh, kind of, I guess I've told you often. I wonder if some of you have come to this evening, to, or this afternoon. See, I'm so used to teaching the evening. I don't even know what time of day it is. I wonder if you've come to, for me to say, oh my God, I got it all wrong. Let me fix everything that I mistaught you. <laughs> dream on, dream on, ladies and gentlemen. That ain't happening yet. Uh, John Maynard Keynes still rules the economic policy of the industrial world. We'll get to that in a minute. What you also were told, and I am pleased to be able to say that again, because it's about you. It's about This is not some cheap shot. I am not an apologist for the government of Canada, or the Bank of Canada, or any, or any other group. What I'm trying to do is make sure you understand what you, uh, you, you, because, you, oh boy, do I like not all looking at faces that are 18. <laughs> and your faces are definitely not 18. Well, well, you know, because when you're 18, I have to say, once upon a time, inflation was 13%. Some of you remember those days. <laughs> Isn't that, this, like, for an instructor's point of view, that's wonderful. So the thing that is so important to understand about what you have created, you and the businesses that you've been part of, <clears throat> or the other organizations you've been part of. The number of people working in this country is at a historic high. Right now, this last month, all, we lost jobs during the, the last recession induced by the pandemic. How could we not? We shut down whole sector, sections of the hospitality and other, and other industries. So of course we lose uh, in literally millions of jobs. All of those jobs replaced. As you know, the headlines tell you, headlines, remember, they used to be what were newspapers. <laughs> Now, the social media and the blogs tell you all the disaster of the uh, raging unemployment. Yes, well, something really interesting is happening, which is to say, of course, that we have record employment levels. And of course, there are thousands of jobs outstanding. So, not too bad. Recognize also that that employment record, fastest job creation, fastest rate of job creation in the industrial world of the major industrial states of all the G7 states and almost all other mature industrial states, we do not compare ourselves to China, for example, but excluding that, you create jobs faster than any other country of those mature industrial states, including the United States. That is a testimony to the strength of the Canadian economy. And I am not here, as I say, an apologist for any public policy, politician, or anyone else. 
I want you to celebrate who you, what you've done, because it's you. You are the working men and women of the country. My pointy-headed students will make a contribution. Yeah, wait a moment. You graduated and did make a contribution. So don't dump on your own success. Important to understand. Yet, we must also understand this rule. The past does not guarantee the future. So we celebrate the past, appropriate to honor the people that we, our accomplishments and those of others, but also important to look forward clear-eyed and take nothing for granted. So that's what's been going, that's what's happened. We've also taught through two oars, and we're in one now. So let's begin with the challenges as we move into the present. Then I'm going to look at the snapshot of the economy, the last most recent stats we have. Then look future, and then we do Q&A. We are, I don't like to say this. As an economist who obsesses over mathematical economic models, math, you know, you guys, I, I think engineers always had some affinity for econ because of the r mathematical rigor underlying economic models. Maybe ours are a little more squishy than the models you use to predict physical, the, the physical universe, but I have to cope with squishy people. Now, when you're cope, yes, well, I do. And, and when you cope with people, you've got to, you've got to, you need some wiggle room because people are wiggly. Oh, by the way, just one small note, ladies and gentlemen, in, in case you look, in case that looks like I'm very frustrated, as you know, if you've ever encountered me before, I must now, because of COVID restrictions, stay away from you. So I can have my mask off. I, have, I can't roam up the corridor and up the aisles. And this is driving me crazy, because I really want to get up and point at somebody. And, and I cannot do that. So <laughs> metaphorically, I'm actually walking up and down uh, this theater. Oh. Anyway, so I must get that frustrated. So I'm going to pace probably here even more than I normally would. So. We are, and this is what I don't like to say, we are in unprecedented territory. All mathematical models, including yours, are all driven by your knowledge of what has happened in the past. The laws of physics are experimentally verified again, verified again and again and again. So of course you know, you, you, have, you have the historical benchmarks of you know what works and you know what does not. So did I, did I. Unfortunately, I and the economists of the industrial world, the market-oriented economists of the industrial world, any of it, are in this difficulty. Of being in unprecedented territory. As soon as precedent is violated, it means you kept trouble making those models work. Because you can't go back to the past. You can't go back to the parameters. That's the difficulty. So what is unprecedented? Well, my goodness, the question almost may be, what is not? Un what, is, what is the same? Well, there are a few things, but there's only a few. There's only a few, ladies and gentlemen. So let's start, to, let's start with this. Global economy. We have a connected world. We have it connected electronically. We have it connected in trade. We have connected in economic relationships of all kinds. The global economy, which dates from, effectively, the global economy really dates from Richard Nixon's uh, uh, travels to China and China's decision that they would actually and join, the, join the world uh, and in, engage in international trade and, and be more pragmatic than they had been in the past, and that they would pursue something called socialism with Chinese characteristics, which the Chinese government has never uh, defined in any satisfactory way, except it means whatever the president of China means it to mean at any point in time. But it is a quasi sort of sometimes market economy if it suits the Chinese government. Approximately half the Chinese workforce works for state-owned enterprises, so the communist state rules, and the other half is actually operating in the financial system, sorry, in the private sector, and of course is more flexible uh, than state enterprises always have been or ever have been. <clears throat> so we have a global economy in terms of its actual rigor, where it's in place maybe 15 years. If you actually want to trace, you know, a lot of talk about this stuff, 
But stitching the world together is a complex process. You need the communications networks as an essential element of that. And in terms of their richness and their depth, we've realized that over the last 15 years. So the problem is we have now, a we had a pandemic with a global economy, that's new. There's the pandemic, that's new. We have the global economy, that's new. We have for the first time economic warfare. Your country is at war with Russia. No, we're not sending troops. We are sending military equipment. But more to the point, we are engaged in economic warfare, cutting off Russia from all of the uh, normal uh, commerce of the connected world, presumably to so disadvantage them that they will stand down from the slaughter of innocent children in Ukraine. I'd ask you also to just pause for a moment and take a thought to the, uh, Ukrainian, uh, the students of Ukrainian Russian descent at the University of Waterloo and the Russian ones as well. They are distressed almost beyond words with respect to what is actually going on. So we have never engaged in global economic warfare of this degree with much of the industrial world, but not all of it, arrayed against Russia. It is only with, oh dear, it is only with great, with great you know, self-discipline that I, I, I'm not referring to the Soviet Union. Because in 1981, this speech would have had to do with the Soviet Union, although oddly enough, I, I would have not changed many of the words with respect to what was going on. So we're engaged in economic warfare. We have, a, which is unprecedented, a global economy, which is unprecedented, a residual pandemic, which is unprecedented. That alone would be enough unprecedented things. Then, of course, it's you characters. You, yeah, instead of being a, you know, a semi-competent engineer barely doing anything, you are transforming technology at a horrendous rate. Don't you understand we need stability? Don't you understand you should take technological development offline? Not, not forever, but like for, I don't know, 10 or 20 years to allow society to adjust? Well, of course, that's not happening. So you do your jobs. You contribute to technological change and transformation of all kinds, much of it really disruptive. You upend entire industries or threaten to do so, which is as dangerous as anything, or sorry, as destabilizing as anything. And of course, as men and women of technology, oh my word, you also know that the general public's understanding of technology is only slightly less than that of, of its knowledge of the economy, which is abysmal, and its knowledge of most technology is equally abysmal, and this investors who invest in the stock market, especially helped by Robin Hood and children investors. Oh, my word, now we get stock prices. Yes, I know. They really did your RSP a lot of good. They did mine, too. It's like ridiculous. I'm an old man, so I have a riff, which the government requires me, requires me to take money I don't want and don't need. <laughs> And it's actually not working because the RIF is rising faster than the money is being extracted from the minimum contribution. So I'm better off than I was the year before, even though they're giving me money. It's very confusing. It's confusing because it's stupid. It is stupid because, among other things, the stock market until two and a half minutes ago was exhibiting values that were preposterous. And if you, if you did like pixie dust and said, yo, that's technology. Yo, Google, your technology. Oh, Facebook, your technology. Tesla, your. <laughs> Tesla. Tesla, before the recent fiasco in the stock markets, had the market value of all its competitors put together while selling a small fraction of vehicles and having no monopoly control over electric vehicles, no proprietary technology that is special to Tesla? Oh my, oh my. So now, we have the stock markets in goofy territory. Ha, huh, but I've taught through this once before. I've taught through the dot bomb stupidity. <laughs> Some of you were in the room during dot bomb stupidity. You may recall I brought a list to class on, on uh, Overheads, you know transparencies? Yeah. Yes, my transparencies. They don't let me use them anymore because they've decommissioned all the equipment. Or I would have brought one just for nostalgia this afternoon. <laughs> I gave you a, whole, a, a gigantic long list of all the dead things that died during the dot bomb fiasco, which of course set off a recession. We also talked through the goofy uh, financial fiasco of 08, 09, driven by the craze, by here, here. Would you, would you like to be a, buy a mortgage, uh, uh, a, security, a set of mortgages? If we take a lot of risky mortgages that we lend to people who don't have high incomes and put them together, 
they become less risky. <laughs> no, no, pile a lot of, no, no, it's, it, 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 it's called not diversification. Well, like, yeah, really and truly. So that blew up. And don't you tell me that investors are more sophisticated now than they were in 91 or 90 or 08, 09. They are not. If anything, they're more misinformed. If, you know, any, oh, who really, buying stocks based on what you read on the social media. If that got any stupor, it'd be hard to imagine. Another unprecedented element that we're in, because we're not even done with the unprecedented stuff yet, is, of course, the pace of misinformation in our society. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I was alive at the birth of the internet. Well, okay, not quite the literal birth of it. But I watched the internet go from an obscure governmental communi military communication tool to everybody's ubiquitous tool. And I remember clearly the idealists of our world. And I say this with respect to them. It's a good thing to be an idealist. It's that or become an apathetic cynic. They believed that the world's information would now be at every person's fingertips. There'd be a no monopoly on knowledge. We'd create for the first time, with no national boundaries, in informed, literate societies, poor countries could draw upon knowledge they would not otherwise have. Advanced economies could rapidly improve themselves. We have political systems, more rational, as in lectors made informed choices. <laughs> yes, in retrospect, re retrospect naive, and only a few people warned that the ability of the internet to send the words of a demagogue around the world in a nanosecond was the greater risk than the belief that people were thirsting for knowledge. And what did the public do the first time they could do this? As opposed to celebrating the freedom that the internet brought, the ability to access any, 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 anybody's website anywhere in the world, they decided that that is too confusing and they must all manage it through Facebook. <laughs> because it's so confusing to have to, to you know, type in you know, addresses to go to places you want to. So let the machine decide what you shall learn. I'm a student of history, as you also know. And I cannot resist observing that the first politician who used mass modern communications was Adolf Hitler. His use of radio. It's out of World War II. We already know what happens, can happen, with mass market communication. So, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, somber times. Oh, we're still not done with unprecedented. <laughs> One more, well, no, because it's so important to recognize that there's a reason the Bank of Canada has made some mistakes. I'm no apologist for governments of Canada, any of them, provincial or federal, or any other governor for that matter. And they should be held to a high account. But let's also be realistic. They're struggling with this unprecedented circumstances as much as we. There is no magic information that they have that you do not. There is no magic stats that they have and you do not. There's no ma mathematical models that they have and you do not. Well, except, of course, for the secret um, uh, mathematical models which are uh, driven by the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, which is about to assume the... That was a bonus assignment stupidity you could submit for extra marks. If I happen to be in my classroom right now, God, the students, every student in the room could have bonus assignments because the stupidity is at volumes that is now breathtaking. I probably would have had to require submitting five examples of stupidity to get one bonus mark. Oh, 
Yes, I'm frustrated, ladies and gentlemen. That's another reason I'm so happy to be here, because it's good for my mental health and blood pressure to have audiences from time to time. But the other unprecedented thing, so important to comment on, because it shapes everything else. And it's a little awkward to talk about it. It's a little awkward for me to talk about it. It's a little awkward to talk in a room of people who aren't all 18. The 18 year olds don't mind this comment. Some of you may find it less attractive, and I find it not attractive at all. And that is, of course, we've run out of babies. Mm. That is my ever so. <gasps> see, I see a small child back there. Yo, man! <laughs> Good for you. We need you. Trouble is, we need more of you. We don't have enough of you. The population is aging rapidly. You also know there's a post-war baby boom, this gigantic number of people born after World War II. How could this be not me? Sorry, it's not plausible for to me, not me. So I'm one of the boomers. Why haven't I retired? Well, <laughs> Well, let's not go there, actually, because <laughs> university doesn't know what the answer is to that question, and, I'm not about, and, and the university reps in the room, and I'm not about to uh, tell them why. <laughs> but the truth is, the leading edge of the boomers are approaching death. Let's say it clearly. The population is aging rapidly. We do not have enough children to replace ourselves. We don't in Canada, we don't in the United States, we don't have, China, in, in, we don't have in China, we don't have in, the, in, in, in Russia, we don't have in um, Europe. The major industrial countries of the planet have rapidly aging populations, so rapidly aging, oh, I can get over here, so <laughs> rapidly aging that they're going to begin to shrink. Some of the fellow already began shrinking. Like, this is not a small point. Not a small point. Like, the housing crisis. Well, the housing crisis will solve itself. Just <laughs> let people die off. <laughs> and we'll have, yes, well, see, uh, uh, that laugh seemed like whistling through the graveyard, but yes. <laughs> keep in mind, I'm fairly close to it myself, so you know. This is a huge consequence. We debated for a big chunk of time this important question. Technological advancement does eliminate particular jobs, lots of them, of all kinds. There used to be people who did drafting. You used to learn the stupidest skills. <laughs> No, no, well, stupid in the sense that now you go tap, tap, and the machine does them for you. I watched the machine take parts of engineering. Took the boring parts, so that was a good thing, generally speaking. And so our question was, as technology advances and advances and advances, and now, of course, we have you know, spooky AI, as it advances and eliminates job functions, are we going to end up in a situation where we have Chronic unemployment. I mean, more, more workers than work needs to be done by humans. In other words, would technology advance so quickly that human work would become, at least for a few, except for elite people, uh, not, pos not possible. Of course, at the same time, we've got the boomers dying off. We're in a race between technology's destruction of jobs and the boomers and your wimpy reproductive behavior. <laughs> well, who are we going to blame for this, by the way? Oh, I did my duty, but still in all. But that was just net, so that didn't actually do anything except keep it from shrinking. So we now know the answer. There's a labor shortage, and technology has not eliminated work fast as fast as the population is aging. So, help wanted signs all over the place. 
and the lure of AI. Oh my, how much money has already been lost in the stock market by artificial intelligence? Let's hope by nobody in the room, since like all new techs, it is oversold and overhyped. It's very useful for particular types of applications, carefully defined, for which there is training data, for which it's high quality training data, and for which the, the, the AI engine is able to give explanations of what it's doing, lest you trust the machine to make decisions for you. Of course, that probably won't trouble you since it picks movies for you and entertainment <laughs> picked your partner. Uh, so, <laughs> well, let's, you know, not pretend. <laughs> so, we have these extraordinary circumstances, either one of which would have made looking into the future challenging. Push them all together, <clears throat> sprinkle a pandemic on top of it all, and then try to figure out what's going to happen next. The answer is, with extraordinary difficulty, is it going to be able to say what happens next? And your public agencies are struggling as much as anyone else with respect to this issue. In the context of a public fueled with raging misinformation. I'm sure it, well, I don't have any trouble understanding why people are frightened. I don't un have any trouble understanding why people are concerned. And if they have limited, inf and started with limited information, they are, they are prone, they are vulnerable to every kind of crazed conspiracy theory known to mankind. So recognize that, that the anxiety is understandable. Don't ever, ever, don't ever be disrespectful of someone else's fear. Even if it's driven by raging ignorance, even if it's driven by the craziest conspiracy ideas, it doesn't change the fact that their fear is real and needs to be acknowledged and managed if possible. But it won't be managed by being disrespectful to those who are frightened. Because frightened men and women do not make rational choices. They never have, and they're not about to start doing that now. How we manage that, I have no magic answers to. But it's going to be a long slog, for sure. Now, a quick catch up to where the economy is at this minute. One or two quick words about the future. I want to then take Q&A, and then we're going to do a, as, this, as the macro course has always ended, with a forecast for medium, short, and longer term future of Canada. I pause. However, I want to do one look at the economy currently. So right now, uh, the Bank of Canada is pursuing the policy, uh, which is, for those of you who still have your course notes, no, don't raise your hand and tell me whether you threw them in the trash, because that would depress me. Uh, but what's going on is, of course, uh, right out of your course notes, uh, what should happen when inflation strengthens. Well, very clear. We have precedent for that, at least. What is one of the things that is still underlying all of this, which has not changed, because some things have not, and that is the dynamic of marketplaces. Prices rising, prices not rising. Why are prices rising? Surprise, surprise. War in Ukraine, shortages of few. Supply shortages caused by labor shortages. Supply shortages caused by the complexity of the supply chains. Very, very logical. Uh, the resilience of the supply chains underestimated, for example. All those, all those unprecedented problems crashed on. The Bank of Canada expected, so the Federal Reserve. A modest bump up in inflation. Remember, we've expanded the money supply dramatically in 0809 to deal with the financial meltdown. Braced ourselves for inflation. Remember the great inflationary bust out of 2010, 2011? No, it didn't happen. Drove everyone crazy. Do you know how terrible it is to be a policymaker, be, be, be afraid of something? And then the thing you're afraid of doesn't happen. And then, of course, after uh, 08, 09, expanded the money supply. I mean, everyone did it, lowered interest rates. What they're supposed to do, right from the textbook. 
waited for inflationary bust out, run the policy quickly in reverse. The economy seemed wimpy. Inflation was relatively low and stable. It's been low and stable for a serious period of time. And so they slowly began to withdraw the money. And then, of course, we end up with this pandemic thing. To sur and now, well, now the inflation has arrived. Savings high, demand high. Of course, part of public policy was to keep demand high so we wouldn't have a recession. So logical is all get out. And the bank's always been very clear. We'll run the policy in reverse. We'll run the policy in reverse. How hard is it to understand we run the policy in reverse? So if you're criticizing us for creating a lot of money, good, we'll take it away. Now you're unhappy because your mortgage rates. Well, fortunately, <clears throat> some older people are, think maybe they can earn some interest finally. <laughs> oh, well, let's not try to pretend, ladies and gentlemen, you know, there's some winners and there's some losers and all of this dynamic. So now the bank's going to drive up interest rates. How high will they rise? Uh, they don't know because they don't have a model to tell them. So they increase the rates and wait, increase the rates and wait, increase the rates and wait. They've indicated that they think that inflation is strong enough that it'll have to have a few more rate increases. So you're paying a mortgage yet? Well, take a deep breath and don't spend money on something else is, is what it amounts to. Our financial markets were also distorted. Another element of the unprecedented nature of our, the, our current circumstances. And that unprecedented nature was the result of the fact that interest rates got low because of 0809 and have stayed low. We haven't had interest rates this low in 400 years. I'm sorry, that this is no precedent. I can't go back to the friggin' 1600s and try to make any, there's no market, there's no like, 1600, my goodness, Charles or whatever is king of England, like really and truly. So, the bank's feeling its way forward, so is the Federal Reserve. And ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you there's any, nothing else is responsible. Trial and error, that should appeal to an engineer. Trial and error, iteration, let's see what happens. No, but it's pragmatic. And if, we, if the last thing we need are some magic, theoretical, lunatic, fantastical things, we now have to deal with inflation. Let's do what we have to do. This means the economy may weaken. First quarter 2000 and um, this year, whatever this year, 22. <laughs> I haven't lost it yet. First quarter of this year, the Canadian economy grew, even though that of the United States and Japan shrank. Now, again, we have a strong forward dynamic of growth, and domestic uh, uh, international trade was somewhat weak. Domestic demand was really strong. You're sitting on a lot of savings. You're still frustrated. Some of you are trying to, ah, what's that word? Uh, travel. <laughs> you know, have, like, have life stuff. You've renovated your houses, as did I, so I can't keep renovating the, can't renovate the renovations. That, like, is too cuckoo. Um, but demand has been strong for the moment. This is a little alarming because it, it, that's one of the reasons the Bank of Canada thinks they'll keep raising interest rates because if you're still spending money, uh, you got to spend less, help the bank. Otherwise, they'll scare you into spending less. Or you get a kid you're, who's paying a mortgage. Remember, you know, the kid, you help pay the down payment for the house because house prices were unaffordable because of the distortion of the financial markets. Now they have a mortgage, which you might even countersign to try to make it all be a good parent. Yeah, well, you may have to be a really good parent over the next couple of years. Say that seriously. That's economic adversity. This is not a forecast of a recession. We simply don't have any basis of knowledge to do it. Is a recession possible? Yes, at this time. A recession is not off the table by any means. There is no way, we've never been able to do policy with the precision which would allow us to find, you know, just tap on the brakes of the economy, get, a, get, get the response you want. Tap on the brake if you want to slow inflation. 
tap on the accelerator to get things moving again. We've never been able to have it. We have to slam the stupid brake on, and then there is a hesitation. It's the damn stupidest car to possibly have where you get this erratic, you know if you slam on the brake hard enough, the car will come to a halt, but it might drive your head through the windshield screen. Or step on the gas and nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing happening, my God, now I'm going supersonic speed, I better slow down again. That's the nature of this, and the unprecedented degrees are making it even more unpredictable than it would normally be under all of those circumstances. Yet the fundamentals still stand. We have not substantially altered Keynesian economics, nor have had a reason to do so. The government leans against the direction of the marketplace to stabilize it. The Bank of Canada does complementary work in its, in, its, in, its, in its mandate, which of course is independent from the government of Canada, as is the Federal Reserve, and are many of the central banks of the industrial world, including those of the European Union and Japan. China is of course different, because the, China, the central bank of China is a central bank with Chinese characteristics, which means it does what the Chinese government tells it to do. And fortunately, the Chinese government is, exhibits quite Keynesian behavior. Even after all these years, ladies and gentlemen, wrapping my head around China as a market sort of economy is still a bit of a struggle especially because they say, kind of do it unpredictably, which is more confusing. So your economy and employment has been strong. Output has been strong thus far. Inflationary pressures are strong too. Less than in other countries, but never mind. The inflation is, of course, a global phenomenon caused by Mr. Trudeau who is the most powerful, well, my goodness, he must be the most powerful prime minister in the entire world if he's causing inflation around the world. But of course, Mr. Mulroney did the same thing. Mr. Mulroney, by contrast, caused the recession, the whole world to go into a recession. Oh, please, get a grip. I can think of lots of reasons to criticize Mr. Trudeau. Setting off global inflation is not one of them. And Mr. Mulroney did not set off global recession. He just coped with one. We're a major trading nation. We could not insulate ourselves from these things if we wish to. So that's where we are. Possibility of a recession, but not yet, cannot yet attach a probability to it. We should know by September through December, because in, if inflation hasn't abated as we move toward the end of the year, it, it, the bank does not expect it to go from where it is now back to the target, um, uh, which is around 2%. Nobody expects that overnight. It just isn't, doesn't work that way. We'd be quite startling if it did. Then we'd dance in the streets. Probably expect a, tr but you want some distinct weakening and, that, and some distinct weakening both in the labor markets and the GDP growth. And enough of a weakening that by the end of the year we will see, okay, if we have a recession, it might be very mild, just a, there's a whole technical recession where there's a little dip, but it doesn't actually cause severe economic distress. But we might not get that, and we'll find out hopefully by Christmas, hopefully, uh, presumably by around Christmas, we should know one of the two. Because otherwise, they'll simply keep raising interest rates until they get the effect they want. Simple, simple as that. Now, I'm going to say one thing about the future, then I'd like to do Q&A. Uh, and be mindful of the time. There is one element of the future which is particularly relevant to Canada. Some of the issues that we all face, misinformation, all countries face that. Aging population. Oh no, ladies and gentlemen. We are similar in many of those unprecedented circumstances, but not the aging of the population. Oh, we're aging all right. But your country has a peculiar advantage. And I do mean peculiar. One of the few countries that has an edge going forward. 
an important circumstance that compensates for some of our challenges, compensates for the aging of the population. Because while the population of Canada is aging, you know that rapid rate of job creation that we've done year after year? Well, it's also reflecting something which is not often commented upon. And you know how I love numbers. And that is that the population of Canada is one of the most rapidly growing populations in the industrial world. The population. It is, for example, we are growing, our population is growing at twice the rate of the United States. Quite remarkable when you think about it. The population of Canada is actually growing slightly, <coughs> excuse me, slightly faster than the population of the world. The only country that rivals us in population growth, not China, of course, is India. And India just gets close to us. Australia matches us. Out of the major countries, that's it. And that population is growing not because of the babies, although it wouldn't hurt to have some babies. I like babies, but you know, nothing wrong with having babies. But that's not why your population is one of the most rapidly growing in the world. Again, excluding, I'm sorry, the developed world, I should say. Although it is actually, there's only an exceptional number, a small number of developing countries which are also outgrowing us, still. And that, of course, is, of course, our immigration levels. We benefit to an abnormal degree compared to our national, to our other country peers as the talent of the world comes to Canada. No matter how you slice that, that is to our extraordinary advantage. The world's talent, to a remarkable degree, is coming to this place. This, this rate of growth, of population growth, is, is, you know, again, it's not suddenly this year. Well, the pandemic, of course, was an interruption. Excluding the pandemic, this rate of population growth driven by immigration. That's where the housing shortage is coming from. And were it not for the immigration, we'd have tens of thousands of unfilled jobs, more than we already have as it is, which is high enough. And that's our edge. Now, we have to be careful and not take it for granted. We have to not take for granted that that talent has to be used. We have to take advantage of the talent. We have to be prepared to take advantage of that talent to provide it the conditions it needs to thrive. But if we do that, if we do that, ladies and gentlemen, we, address, we have the resources to deal with many of the challenges we face. Oh, by the way, I left out one of the unprecedented difficulties, an existential threat because of climate change. Didn't forget it. I try not to make you all depressed. <laughs> Those are high challenges, scientifically documented that will require multiple solutions. There is no magic answer to, in, to environment or anything else. You need a large number of people, the largest possible number of people, with the skills <clears throat> to solve problems and the training to create new solutions. The only resource that counts over the next couple of decades is the quality of the human talent that we can draw upon. And we have to mobilize that talent. Oh, yeah, still, and we have to mobilize that talent. We can be stupid and fail to mobilize it. Thus far, we've avoided, we've avoided, we've used most of the talent. We've wasted some of it. And we should do a better job. But largely speaking, the talent has been deployed effectively. Now, I will, I'm going to say a few other things about the future. I'd like to pause for a moment, however, and um, take Q&A. And if you don't ask questions, I'll keep talking, and you'll be sorry. So just, 
Yes, please. Oh, my goodness, yes. Oh, well, my, oh, yes, I was here too, so I remember. <laughs> no, I remember. Yes. What I was, the, the, the you, phrase has stuck with me, but I must confess, in greater context, it's hard to say. Um, but it's a question. Yes, I do. Yes, <laughs> I really. I to Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat the question. Um, yeah, with the mask and everything, I'll repeat the question. The question was, uh, this kind person actually repeated part of a lecture back to me. It's a good thing I'm not too sensitive about that. Uh, uh, and because one of the phrases I said when discussing demographic trends in the course was uh, within our lifetime, we might see the last house built that Canada will need. That was, so he, he asked about that, he, that phrase seems to have haunted him. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I, I can't resist wondering whether his job is as in the development industry, but let's... Yeah. <laughs> okay. but, but let me answer the question, because it, it, um, I do remember that section of the lecture, and then possibly I didn't make the point clearly enough. The, at that stage of the game, I was concentrating solely on the demographic trends of the, uh, of the birth rate. So we did, we do, the, we, like again, this business about the birth rate is not new. I've always taught in the courses about the post-war baby boomers because they are they disrupted the marketplace as they as they aged, right? At one minute you've got schools like you've got to build schools all over the place, and now we're converting schools back into retirement homes. Like it's but, creepy as all get out. Um, so it, it, part of that discussion was was a very simple argument. I pointed out that if the birth rate, and then we, this is what I was trying to make the point, um, and and I I can't. Immigration would have been done in a separate part of the course. So I, there I was just concentrating on the birth rate. I was trying to get students to understand that if the birth rate stays where it was when you would have heard it, what year was that again? 0405. Oh, okay, 0405. Because by then it's already below replacement. And I'm saying, look, if it stays below replacement and you don't do your responsibility, I'll avoid asking you how many children you have. It, it, oh, very good, okay, well, that's holding your own anyway. Uh, <laughs> But no, seriously, the, the issue was just, I was trying to demonstrate that mathematically, in the absence of anything else happening, the population will start shrinking. And if you, and of course, I think I even said, what if you build the, la the one too many last house that we will need? Um, so yes, the, 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 and that would have been true. So for example, uh, the population of Italy is already, the uh, population of Japan is now absolutely shrinking. And in a, now, of course, not. Keep in mind that, of course, the population can shrink and you still have a shortage of houses in one place and, and, and houses unavailable or vacant elsewhere. And that was the point I was trying to make, that if we looked solely at the demographic issues, our population will begin to shrink. Now, from my point of view, Fortuner Society had already chosen immigration as an, I mean, we are an immigrant society after all. So it is not to say some radical thing, let's, let's, yeah, let's, um, Let's have immigration as if we've never had it in the past, as if you know, there, virtually everyone in the room is likely, unless you're a member of Canada's indigenous communities, to be an immigrant to the country, directly or indirectly, or whether yesterday afternoon or generations ago, it makes no difference. You know, in that sense, except for indigenous persons, we're all immigrants uh, to, to, to the country. So that's what I was trying to say. Yes, please shout. Yes? So, Fred Woods was almost 80 years ago now. Uh, do you feel that the US dollar is under threat? I mean, that speculation has been going on for a long time. Do you feel that it's more, that it's closer to reality and do you foresee uh, de-dollarization of the US? The US dollar is under greater threat now with respect to its standard. I mean, 
the US dollar has for a long time been, as, and you're, as, as you correctly observed, the stand of the world's global economy. It's the exchange economy. You know, it's the main economy that is the world's reserve economy. For a whole bunch of complicated reasons, the size of the US economy alone would dictate it. And there has been no real substitute. Even the euro, while a powerful uh, international exchange, does not have the power. Uh, one of the ways we have, of course, tried to pressure Russia is to restrict their supply of US dollars. And that's why they're insisting or asking uh, that the, their oil uh, exports be paid for in rubles to support their currency. Uh, because, of, the, of course, the problem is if you pay, when they're paid in US dollars, they have trouble using the US dollars because they've been pushed out of the exchange system. So, but your question with respect to the future of the US dollar is very, very difficult for me to say because it's, it, it, it always, that dollar was driven by the strength of its economy. Like, that's clear. The biggest economy in Earth, strongly growing, uh, home to many of the great technology ventures of the world. There, a lot of powerful dynamic was giving uh, support to that value. Valuable currencies is often emotional. Uh, and the US dollar also suffers from you know, positive emotional karma attached to it, in the same way that cryptocurrency uh, attracts crazy karma. <laughs> I'm only with great difficulty not going into that swamp. Uh, unless you wish me to. But, the, but back to the observation, the difficulty I face in commenting about the uh, continued role of the US dollar is I would have to tell you about the continued strength of the US economy. And in this world in which all those unprecedented circumstances I spoke about that apply to us also apply to the United States, right? And while, they have a economy, uh, while their population is growing more than Europe, for example, which is also to their advantage. But they have huge disadvantages which are growing more acute. I have watched over my lifetime, and I'm a political junkie, because the first presidential election I watched, like as a you know, conscious person, is that of John Kennedy. So I have obsessively, and, and my, my father's born in Brooklyn, so you know I have long Yankee connections. And I've watched it over my lifetime. The country is now almost ungovernable. It is a challenge for an industrial state, independent of you whether you think the government should take a stronger or weaker role in the direction of an economy. And that's, that's, that's a debate that you know, has many elements to it. But you don't want a government that cannot function at all. And the US government has not been functioning now for some time. Mr. Biden's predecessor, <laughs> whose name I shall not mention, so great is his shame and so sweet is the sound of his name to his own ears, presided over that inability to get anything done. The United States has now trouble running elections. If you now have a state in which its own electoral process is impaired, and it is, its credibility is impaired, we've just voted in Ontario. Boring is all get out. <laughs> yes, boring is wonderful. When I go in to cast my ballot, as I certainly did, no ridiculous lines, everything's smooth, everything's courteous. I'm welcomed four times and thanked when I leave. That's Ontario. <laughs> Among the major uh, democracies of the planet, only the United States does not have an independent electoral agency. They're all state sanctioned. And now the politicians are trying to get their hands on the electoral machinery of the individual states. The next election in America is going to be waged in the courts. Almost inevitable because of the dynamic underway. And all of those circumstances suggest, at the best, US economic policy, foreign policy, let's just leave off the table. But domestic economic policy, which drives the economy, which would support the dollar. Uh, is in disarray, and therefore I cannot answer your question. <laughs>
No. But that's scary. Like, I should, I should, I should have been able to say yes or no, right? Because the, the, and right now, the dollar's maintained that its relative position over the last several years. But that is partly because there's no credible alternative. And, and, and so some of that is, is its current position is more by default than by leadership. And so that, I guess the nature of my question, the nature of my question is such that circumstances were so different upon going back to July first, nineteen forty four, where the Disney company uh, or, or where the seat. And the circumstances this many years later are so different. And so I guess I'm just wondering how do they maintain Well, it, it, who, I'm wondering what would, what would make it make that sustainable. I don't see it. Well, I, the challenge we have, and this is, I'm not being funny at all, this is a scary prospect. Our ability to anticipate elements like that is becoming more and more uncertain. It would have been easier to answer that question even five years ago than, than, than today. And of course, among other things, we, we need another John Maynard Keynes to orchestrate the international arrangements that were put in place at the end of World War II, where they actually did policy, and where they took chances, and they, it, you know, they assembled a consensus of opinion. Hard to f see what politician could manage that now. Now, it's been managed in, in response to the war in Ukraine, slightly to my surprise. So possibly, possibly there is some potential. If I, on my worst days, I fear we need a catastrophe or crisis to stir the world. Like oh, please, no more pandemics. <laughs> but I, I, on, 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 someone said war, please don't set me off. This, <laughs> wait, oh, sorry, I saw a person first. Go ahead, please. I would say, I still have a lot of contact with individual students, so I feel comfortable answering. Uh, in some ways, they are trying to capture the right, the, the, the right, express this properly. They're anxious, that's for sure. How could they not be? But it hasn't paralyzed them. They are still, you know, they're still, they're still making career plans. Their career plans are still somewhat unrealistic, <laughs> but so are yours. <laughs> so don't criticize them for that. They are a touch more cautious, which unfortunately is the worst thing you can do in a rapidly changing situation is try to cautiously just do what happened before. To give you an example, which is unhelpful to them and to their talent. So their anxiety isn't stopping, isn't par paralyzing the responses, but it is causing them to be very conservative, not necessarily in a political sense, but I mean in a personal sense. It means, for example, they are, without thinking about it, <clears throat> I'm trying to be calm here, <laughs> seeking employment at the largest organization that will hire them. They have the naive belief, because this wasn't even true in the past, that if they joined a big prestigious thing, that mother employer would look after them. So first mom and dad look after them, then mom and dad send them to university. Now they look for another mom and dad that will give them a bigger allowance <laughs> than their biological parents. I'm not trying, I, I would like to think I was being funny, but that is unfortunately describing the sophistication of some of our students' responses. Now, I shout at them, 
to remind them that size and status is not a harbinger of anything. I'll avoid asking anybody in the room to raise their hands if they work for Nortel. <laughs> well, it's, it is naive. Like, no, am I saying you should not join a, a Google? Well, of course I'm not saying that. If it's the right employer for you, offering the right, the, the right opportunity, if they're gonna help develop your skills and give you mo mobile skills, go join them, absolutely. I would celebrate it, but I wanted part of a strategy. I want when you, I, my poor students, the, the current students, they, they really don't like to encounter me as they approach graduation. So I go to their graduation function so they can't avoid me. <laughs> I do, sorry, that's the truth. I, I, see, I, yeah, I'm happy to laugh, but like, I don't tell jokes, I, I actually do this. So, so for example, I, I, I go to their functions. I've, that's why I say, so what are you doing in graduate? I mean, congratulate them, obviously, and I want to wish them success, so, but I, of course, want to know where, where did you join? And, and they'll tell me, and then I, of course, will ask, why do you believe that's the best employer for you? Like, I, can't, I mean, even cope with the student saying, well, it's the only offer I got. If they've applied 10 places, then I'll say, good. But frequently, of course, I'll say, why? And they say, well, it was my fourth year co-op employer, and it is humongous. Did you consider alternatives? Did you? So they, they're joining an employer solely because of the odd circumstance of the matching algorithm of the co-op system <laughs> that put them at company X. Uh, but it's easier, easier than thinking too hard. And if it's big, big is good. Yeah, well, you know, I can run through a giant list of companies where big did not guard you in any way. And if we're right that the world will be more tumultuous and more uncertain, which is one of the things I'm going to say when I wrap up, Big, is, big can be a challenge because big tends not to be fast-footed. And in rapidly changing circumstances, joining a behemoth of a company that moves at glacial speed, everything funneled through the CEO's office to get anything done, and there are 25,000 employees. Oh, my. Fast-footed, you wouldn't say, with respect to large organizations and their ability to innovate, for instance. You shouldn't criticize them for innovating poorly, because they're like dancing bears. Never critique a ba dancing bear, being it's a miracle the bear can dance at all. <laughs> and the extra caution being caused by our tumultuous world uh, will put some of them at risk. Best answer I can give in less than half hour. Yes, at the back. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be with you next. Yeah, it, 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 again, I can only answer relatively briefly just because we are now going to run out of time. I'm going to take one more question, then we're going to do a wrap-up. And I'm happy to answer questions when, when we conclude because I'm mindful of the time and they've told me to be 
careful about the time. Since I get millions of words, just one, please. So let me just answer. So, so my, my first answer is, um, <clears throat> excuse me. There is no doubt that there are winners and losers in any kind of emerge in any kind of difficult situation and a challenging one. Uh, my first comment, however, about, about climate change is, while in in fact there may be some advantages to Canada, which you know which, there are some logical possibilities given that we are a f f f uh, northern frozen place. Uh, of course, at the same time, at the same time, while you may have more arable land, uh, you have a big chunk of the permafrost which is thawing. And, and that, that alone represents a different challenge. So very, very complicated. However, the truth of the matter is, separate from the fact that there may be some advantages uh, to Canada, it is still not clear net based on those other circumstances, like the, 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 the change in uh, precipitation, because that's another element of what makes agriculture. The weather is becoming steadily unpredictable as the jet streams sh shift up and down. Now, this is not the occasion to discuss all of those details. I would, however, make one other comment um, and that is that they, they, I still live on this planet, and there are many parts of the planet that will be rendered uh, virtually uninhabitable. So if we think that we have you know, migration issues right now, uh, we haven't seen anything yet. I have, I have colleagues, for example, uh, who still have uh, relatives in, um, in the Punjab in India, and they're actually sending them sandals. Because the grand, I mean, we, we have now temperatures over 40 degrees, which means the ground is so hot, it, you actually cannot walk barefooted. So you actually need, and, and if you're poor, barefooted is how you would, sorry, how you would normally have walked. So the, the so I, I feel a responsibility also to, to see this as a planetary phenomenon. Now again, I'm mindful of the time, so we'll have one more question. Oh my goodness, you're saving the best questions for last. Okay, set me off. Uh, okay, again, let me just try to answer relatively briefly. Then I want to wrap up, and if you have other questions, I'm happy to. Again, I, I'm mindful of the time and that you have other commitments, so, I, but let me answer. It, it's, um, unfortunately, <clears throat> climate change attracts a lot of interest. And like many public issues, not a lot of thoughtfulness attached to some of these issues either. Uh, the truth is, if we look at the science of it, nuclear power has, is relative safe. There have been some exceptional circumstances which were in all cases contained. I am not interested, for example, in judging the, the ability, the sort of safety of nuclear power stations by what went on in the Soviet Union's inability to do anything that was coherent. So Chernobyl is not a lesson to any of us except in grotesque technical stupidity. Um, so, the, so, the, the, for, so, for example, just to give you one tangible example, uh, Germany is now in an extraordinarily difficult energy position because they need a Russian natural gas. So one of Russia's ability to slaughter Ukrainians is a direct function of the fact that Germany needs to pay for the natural gas that Russia is still shipping to Germany and that Ukraine, by the way, is allowing to be shipped because one of the pipelines goes through, through Ukraine. Ukraine. So, of course, part of their ag ag difficulty is that after the um, um, difficulty in Japan, uh, where, of course, they put the nuclear power station almost on the floodplain, like, oh, really? Now, that was a brilliant manu maneuver, too. Uh, uh, although still in all, the damage was largely contained. In any event, uh, so that caused the German uh, environmentalists to raise such a ruckus uh, the, German, the German government, for no particular reason whatsoever, uh, began de decommissioning its nuclear power stations. It has uh, only a handful left running, uh, because right now we're in a much better energy position than being dependent on Russia, the Soviet Union, its old adversary, like really and truly. How much brain power did that take? Uh, the difficulty, of course, is, and the German government's official policy as of yesterday afternoon is they will continue decommissioning the nuclear power stations, even though they have this other uh, difficulty. So we are unfortunately afflicted by 
all of his pushing and shoving, very little overarching coherent public policy. The other question also Im Im implied the same thing. Uh, we've got we've got like bits and pieces of public policy, different provinces, different federal governments, also other governments doing the same thing. Much of it doesn't fit together. So we're going to have electric cars. The governments of the industrial world have now electric cars are what we've got to do. Now, at one level, that will reduce uh, carbon emissions. Yes, well, how, where's the electricity coming from? Because electricity is coming from fossil fuels. We've actually made it worse. You're an engineer. You know that if I take oil and turn oil into electricity and then transmit electricity, it's going to take more, more fuel than if I actually use that energy efficient internal combustion engine because all of that transformation of energy is going to have all energy cost loss. It's the laws of physics. Hmm. So, of course, Mr. Tesla does not talk about it except making wild statements about solar power everywhere, uh, all over the place. Uh, let's leave aside the recycling challenges of lithium batteries because if they can only recycle so many times, then what are you going to do with them? And the recycling problems of lithium batteries is very high. So, the truth is, if we dramatically increase the degree <clears throat> excuse me, of electric car vehicles and you actually drive them, where all that electricity is coming from is not immediately clear to, you, any, to, to anyone in general, since energy planning is so poorly done in general in most countries of the industrial world. I would say with respect to climate change and these issues, we remain in a situation where public policy is incomplete. That's my most gentle way I can describe it. Uh, and it's not even fully, con even the parts that are there are not even consistent with each other. Since I, I, want, I want a clear plan from my government of where the electricity is going to come from, since one of the one of the good sources is um, um, nuclear power, uh, warning, warning, danger, danger. I have a conflict of interest since I have family members who are associated with the nuclear power industry. <laughs> well, I just sorry. I just well, no, I'm I, I'm. That's 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 appropriate to to point out, lest you think uh, that I am making an unscientific observation. Of course, I'm completely correct in what I just say, but. <laughs> I have family members. Again, I'd like to, I'd like to do a quick wrap up. If there are other questions, please just come ask me. Hang on. I'm also dying of thirst. Talking, ladies and gentlemen, is thirsty work. So what does the future hold? Well, I mean, part of it is already, already implied. We're just going to have to get used to a degree of uncertainty that we're not used to. Uncertainty about things like the US dollar uncertainties about climate change and public policies, uncertainty about uh, labor markets, uncertainty about walking into a store and taking for granted that when you go to buy something, it'll be on the shelf. In early days when I had the Soviet Union still existed, I would teach my students about the, the, the Soviet Union, of course, and point out that because of central planning with the Soviet Union, consumer goods were often in short supply. Why, for example, during the Soviet regime, car drivers, <clears throat> any time it started to rain, they'd have to drive their vehicles to the side of the road, go to the trunk, open the trunk, and put the um, wiper blades on their windscreen because the wiper blades were in such short supply that your car was unusable if it was damaged or stolen. So you kept them in the trunk and then put them on when you needed them and took them off after. Hmm. I pointed out that you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about that in Canada. And now I walk into my grocery store, and I see whole shelves which are bare. I felt it was like first time that happened to me. It was like a flashback. I have never gone into a grocery store in Canada, seeing empty shelves when I'm trying to buy Cheerio pops or what the hell ever, like breakfast food, breakfast cereal, short supply. I couldn't find my Cheerios because there was a disruption in the supply chain. Said the store. And we're talking about a big, you know, giant, you know, Sobe store. You know, Loblaws also had similar shortages. That's, we're going to have to get used to that. that is, don't expect those things to be resolved quickly. Expect lots of bumping and grinding on, on the side of technology as well. However, however, our real ch challenge is going forward, really straightforward. And that is using our human talent. It's our most precious resource. All of the challenges we get addressed we, will be addressed by talented men and women who don't panic, who stay calm and carry on, 
And we've got another cultural advantage, you Canadians, you. You really don't get excited about much. <laughs> now, sometimes this is not a good thing, because you're not really good at partying. But you don't panic as much as goes on in other countries. You haven't panicked about immigration, for instance. Public opinion polls say consistently the strong majority of the population describe immigrants as a net contribution to the country. And that hasn't varied in more than 15 years. There's an example of boring stability. And if, we were, if we're going to get through the future, we need a culture that's relatively calm. So something happens that's spooky, keep your wits about you, keep working. Tell the people around you, family and friends, stay calm. We'll work it out. And make sure everyone you get near has an opportunity to use their talent. My current work at the university, we are exploring an explicit commitment to help all of our students become innovators. Not just you in engineering, but all of the students at the University of Waterloo. And possibly some of you. I must share with you that sometimes when I'm talking to an engineer, they're really keen to apply existing technologies, tweak them, shift them from one use to another. That's good. Don't stop doing that. But they seem to be uneasy if they have got to create a really new tech. Create it, not use it. Seem to be waiting for someone else to do the heavy lifting. In the future, ladies and gentlemen, that won't work. We need all of you to be innovators, not just managers of innovation, not just users of innovation. Those are good things, but the game is rising. Yeah, I'm student-oriented, even now even though I'm now multiple times older than my students. But if I return to the question about how they're reacting to today's world and what I try to get them to understand, is that they all must now be active participants in trying to find new solutions. Not just be informed about them, but to have new solutions. Operationally, Employers are also shifting their perceptions, which is both quite a challenge for our students. You know the old model. In the old model, well, really old model, preceding you, if you came to Canada and were healthy, you could make a life. If you were healthy and you could work, you could make a life, you could, you could have a partner, you could have a kid, you could a couple of kids, you, you, and they did actually, and you could have a house, decent house. And Maybe a used car, the first car you bought, but then you'd get a bigger, better car later in life. Then it was not enough to be healthy. Now you had to have skills, education. So your country has one of the highest rates of post-secondary educated population in the world, also greater than that of the United States. One of the reasons you have higher job creation than the US is you have more educated people as a proportion of the population. So Canada got education right, at least. But then, of course, the bar keeps rising. And the next thing was, of course, if you're young, yeah, yeah, well, you need, you need training, but you also need experience. So as a young person, but I'm young. How can I have experience? I've been just hatched. And the founding president of the university, who I was privileged to actually know, yes, that's how old I am. Goodness. His name, after all, is on my first degree. I spoke to Gerald Hagee when he was president emeritus, and I became, became a faculty member. And he described, if we're going to build a university in Waterloo, and there is already one that had <coughs> expelled him for being radical, a marketing executive from B.F. Goodrich, radical. But he was, you see, because he and a small group of business associates thought that the next, that to meet the shortage of technically trained people that they anticipated, and we're in the 50s, and he's looking forward, 
the students should have experience, not just appropriate education. And thus was born co-op. And as he said, and as he said to me, <laughs> sorry, this, this is killing me. As he said to me, because if he, in the other world, I'd be up standing shouting at you, just like nose to nose, virtually. Um, as he said to me, we needed a better product. This institution is born as an exercise of educational innovation. And so now, so that, thus co-op. But now, the bar has raised again. Now we have to tell students in the job interviews, yes, talk about the degree, you know, your domain knowledge. Talk about, well, if your transcript is OK. <laughs> Otherwise, just talk about your co-op job. <laughs> well, we try to be pragmatic. With, I'm trying to help them, right? So sometimes you have to give them pragmatic guidance. <clears throat> There's, of course, no correlation between your income and your grade average. Really, you know how annoying that is to a professor that your <laughs> marks? I'm not being funny. You cannot correlate grade averages with any outcomes in life. You can a degree. You can the degree, but not the grade average. There's a better correlation with height and success in life <laughs> than there is in grades. But now we have to tell students to be prepared for an uh, interview question that asks about what ideas do they have. Don't even have to have solutions. They don't have to have like magic solutions. But they have to have good questions to ask. So not just, I have experience in my domain, I like co-op. I have the expertise in my domain. But if you ask me what I'm thinking about my domain, I could say, well, I'm concerned that AI is overhyped. And the interviewer says, why do you think that? And the student says, now you see the bar's risen again. And our employers, especially the aggressive ones, are asking for ideas. And I have to tell the student that if the interview talks only about your technical skills, and the precision with which your co-op job applied to the job on graduation. And a different employer asks you questions like, what ideas do you have about your domain? Pick the latter employer. He's likely to survive. And the employer, any employer who wants good soldiers is going to be an inflexible organization in uncertain times. I cannot resist observing that when I began, I listened to the chairman of the board of Nortel, our crown jewel technology company at the time, say that they wanted independent entrepreneurial thinkers to join Nortel. And then I watched the HR machinery of Nortel issue the most narrow, precise job descriptions. Bit of a disconnect there, wasn't there? So that's the world that faces us. We're all on the ramparts. There's no elite of brilliant thinkers going to save us. Wouldn't hurt to have a few brilliant thinkers, just a few more than we have. This is a team effort. And each member of the team says those, the words that change the world. I have an idea. Let me tell you. And the team listens. Funny enough, I think our grandmothers would be quite I think our grandmothers would understand that kind of guidance. So maybe, in our tumultuous world, the old virtues also will pay us dividends. I have long since abstained from wishing any student or any graduate or anyone I meet good luck. 
I remember once going through Carl Pollock Hall, and there on the scroll in front of Ensoc was a crawling line that said, because it was end of term, good luck on your exams. I went to Ensoc and asked them what was possessing them to put <laughs> such a stupid thing on their sign after five brutal years, you're telling the engineering students of the University of the Waterloo that the only way they're going to get through their exams is if they're lucky enough to get the one question they know the answer to. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I shout quite loudly and Ensoc changed the scroll. <laughs> I fought that battle like 50 times. No, ladies and gentlemen. I wish luck to idiots. I wish us all success in these tumultuous and uncertain times. Welcome back to the university. And it has my, been, excuse me, as it always has been, my pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of reunion.